So with that, it is my uh, true honor to introduce our keynote uh, lecturer for today. We're very, very grateful that Dr. Patrick Lynch has traveled. In fact, he travels all over the world. So we're a stop on one of his, uh, his worldwide tour, but um, he, he's traveled uh, here from Houston, Texas to be with us. He's a professor of medicine. He, he tells us that he's a citizen now because he's recently retired, but he's a professor of medicine um, at the University of Texas MD Anderson, where he essentially started the hereditary cancer program there from inception to the powerhouse internationally recognized program that it is today. Um, he's a world-renowned expert in hereditary GI cancer syndromes, polyposis, as well as Lynch syndrome. And we're really, really honored to have him give us a grand overview of the past, the present, and the future of Lynch syndrome. Dr. Lynch, thank you so much for being here. All right. Well, thanks. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, I actually have a few uh, preliminary uh, comments. Um, let's see. Where's the just one forward to it? Oh, here we are. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I, I just retired about a year ago after being at MD Anderson uh, for 34 years. Um, you know, it's, I, I love patient conferences. I think this is about the third or fourth one I've been to. We hosted one at MD Anderson some years ago. And as I was sitting here having breakfast, I was kind of reflecting a little bit on what it all means. You know, you all uh, have a problem based on the uh, comments about having a mutation in the MLH1 or MSH2 gene. And this has been, is, and, and will be an issue in your family for many, many generations. And that's just a fact of life for you. But at institutions, uh, doctors come and go, researchers come and go. And so I think one of the important things at an institutional level is to develop a sense of continuity as well. So uh, this conference is part of a series uh, that are sort of built around a memorial to Dennis Onan, who was a dear friend of mine, a GI, many of you I'm sure knew very well, and took care of you. Uh, but we were old friends, and Dennis very much recognized uh, many years ago, uh, long before he fell ill, uh, the importance of continuity in a program uh, that deals with patient problems that require long-term management. Uh, and it was for that reason that he mentored uh, Swati and others to eventually take his place. And I've been visiting with her and her colleagues over the last few days. Uh, I've been uh, very, uh, uh, it, it's been very heartwarming to me to see how Swati is already uh, mentoring uh, a new generation uh, of colleagues who will be here in years to come to take care of you and members of your family and, and others, uh, others like it. And so uh, I have strived very hard. In fact, I was just talking to a colleague of mine from Italy that we're in the process of recruiting to MD Anderson because I was not really satisfied with my so-called succession plan uh, at MD Anderson. So I'm pretty happy about that. So although I come from MD Anderson uh, in Texas, I have uh, actually have unusually deep Colorado roots. Uh, my mom was born here. She was a nursing cadet at the university during the war. Uh, she met and married my father here in Denver. Uh, we were up here earlier in the week to bury her ashes. Uh, she died 11 years ago, but we're just now getting around to burying her ashes up in Longmont, uh, where my grandparents and great grandparents uh, are buried. So, uh, and uh, that my great grandfather homesteaded on what was um, a sugar beet farm, which is now unfortunately underneath part of the freeway that goes out to the uh, out to the airport. Uh, so we don't have that farm in the family anymore. Uh, I'll be I'll be taking kind of a historical perspective today uh, on uh, what I call HNPCC. I don't use the term Lynch syndrome. That's a very long story. Uh, but as many of you know, my my dad Henry Lynch uh, really did a lot of pioneering work in this field, and I can't give a talk without alluding a little bit uh, to some of his work. And uh, we worked together off and on for a number of years. And I one of my most vivid memories, and so this is kind of a warning. One of my most vivid memories was uh, he often would be, because he was who he was, the keynote speaker at a conference. 
and he would cover everything. He would cover everything. And so the most common uh, comment from a speaker later on in the conference was, as Dr. Lynch was saying, or to follow up on what Dr. Lynch said, and, and it used to drive me crazy because he would like to scoop everybody else's presentation and sometimes leave them with not a whole lot to say. So my apologies in advance to anyone uh, if I do that. So I'll be, I'll be going through a lot of things very, very quickly. Uh, and we will be trying to stick to a schedule, but sometimes I go off on tangents and uh, the only way you can really keep me on schedule is to just just cut me off and be, but be assured if there was anything that I was going to say that might have been of some utility to you, but I got cut off before getting to it, uh, we'll have ample opportunity to circle back. Somebody else will will be covering that in some way anyway, or you can feel free uh, to ask me about it. And lastly, um, one of the concerns that I always have coming to a patient conference is, and I've been talking to Swati and others about that, is as an academic, I think I know what's important in this area, and uh, I tend to speak to what I consider important, but I, I cannot know if the issues that I consider important to you really are the issues important to you. And so uh, please, 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 I'm very approachable. Um, and as the day goes on, if there are things that, you know, gee, Dr. Lynch, you, you commented on this, but I didn't understand it, or uh, could could we amplify that? Can we talk about it more? I love nothing more than than these buttonhole conversations where we have an opportunity to uh, expand on these things. So without any further ado, I'm going to blow through a lot of uh, a lot of information. Uh, just you know, make a note if there's just something like you didn't understand you want to talk to me about later. Uh, and by all means, cut me off when it's when it's time. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, well, so the good news is, the good news is sometimes I have to give very, very short talks. And believe it or not, it takes a lot more time to prepare a very, very short talk. But because I've been given kind of carte blanche to uh, take as much time as I want, I'm ready now. Uh, so I'll be talking a bit about the historical perspective. Now, a lot of this, it, it, for some of you, this will all be old information. For some of you, it may be sort of an interesting uh, walk through the, the history of things. Um so one of the things that, and, and I cannot emphasize this too much, one of the things that's that's very important to you as patients uh, is to, re and I'm sure some of you have uh, stories, maybe horror stories like that, that you can tell uh, about going to a doctor, obviously nobody here at the Colorado Medical Center because obviously they're experts, but possibly your provider's back home and you said, gee, I have an MLH1 mutation, and they were like, you know, those in the uh, deer in the headlights, like, I don't know what you're talking about. So, so to this day, many, many providers, even medical oncologists and surgeons and gastroenterologists are really unfamiliar with uh, not only the nuances, but sometimes even the kind of more important features of these conditions. So, you know, don't blame them. They have a million other things to have to be thinking about, and not everybody can be an expert uh, on everything. So I think this is part of where advocacy comes in of, you know, it part of your job is to kind of work with your providers to, you know, not not embarrass them, but but you know, really kind of coax them in the, in the direction of getting uh, up to speed. Uh, so we'll be talking a little bit about uh, how, how we've gotten to uh, our current standards for managing risk. I'll talk a little bit, uh, but not a lot about uh, the guidelines for HNPCC management, because others will be uh, talking about that. And I'll be talking a lot about things that I think are kind of uh, on, on the horizon. Um, so I'm assuming that because you're here, you've already addressed a lot of this issue, so I won't talk a whole lot uh, about that. Uh, I will certainly be talking a bit about, and so since you already have family uh, mutations known, some of this may not be as relevant to you uh, as it will be to some patients that may be coming to you for uh, guidance as somebody who's been down this path before. So I will be talking a little bit about where we currently are going with genetic testing and the broader and broader brush we're using uh, in doing the genetic testing. Uh, so for example, it, you can simply Google uh, genetic testing or genetic testing for cancer susceptibility or direct-to-consumer testing, and you'll find a wealth of information, uh, some of it uh, very, very proprietary, uh, being put out there by laboratories that are marketing uh, genetic testing. Some of them uh, are here, uh, and they're all over the place in terms of the quality 
uh, of the information they provide and how helpful it is to you. And these are just kind of random examples of the kind of things that you would come across if you just Google you know, genetic testing for cancer and so forth. So let's back up to the beginning. So this all goes back well over 100 years that the first family with what we now know uh, is HNPCC was identified. Uh, but keep in mind, back then, you know, before 1993, uh, we only kind of suspected that there even was such a thing as Lynch syndrome or HNPCC. Uh, we had patterns in families that were certainly consistent with what we call autosomal dominant uh, transmission. Uh, but in a given family, uh, it, it could be very, very difficult uh, to to have any degree of certainty that this condition was present at all. Uh, and there were there were um, epidemiologists right up to the time that the first gene for this was identified, who basically said there is no such thing uh, as a hereditary disposition to colon cancer uh, outside of the very rare condition of familial polyposis. So. Uh, discovery of genes was just a huge game changer here. Uh, and this was the family originally described by this pathologist, uh, Worthen, back in uh, 1913. Uh, so here's a, a picture of uh, my dad, Henry Lynch. If there's any family resemblance, uh, well, that's how it is. Uh, but notice this was back in the 1970s and, and data gathering at that point was that we had Fortran cards. These were pieces of paper you would punch holes in uh, and feed into a computer computer uh to give you and so this is how data were, cl were collected then so a, a lot has has changed back then that was as uh, good as it uh, as good as it could get uh so during all of that time from from Worthen's original work to um, other case reports of families because that's really all it was was case reports uh and and what we came to know by the late 80s or early 90s was simply that there are so many case reports that there are patterns and similarities that seem to be running through these families, certain tumors that seem to be more uh, prevalent uh, than others uh, in these families. And so, you know, the things that I was able to contribute were things like, well, small bowel cancer looks like it's part of this picture. Some of these skin tumors, these funny skin tumors, these sebaceous adenomas and keratoacanthomas were part of this. But all of this was purely descriptive, uh, really nothing more than gathering together a lot of uh, uh, case reports. So things started to change, not so much with HNPCC, but actually a few years before that. In this other condition that I gave a talk about the, the night before last, familial polyposis, uh, which is, is a, a, a very different, but uh, shares a lot of similarities. But that condition involves so many polyps of the colon at a very early age that it really can't be confused with anything else. So it was very, very clear that it was genetic and inherited and associated with cancer and so forth. So it was actually very easy to be sure that a given family had this condition and to study it. So uh, investigators in 1987, that's not that long ago, in 1987, uh, established that there was linkage between various markers on uh, chromosome 5 uh, and the occurrence of polyps and cancer in these families. But it took four years, given the fairly primitive genetic sequencing techniques that were available at that time, it took four years to actually identify the sequence uh, of that gene and be able to identify uh, mutations in the gene. So at about that time, uh, an international collaborative group called the International Collaborative Group creatively uh, on HNPCC was formed. And this is a picture from 1990. Uh, I didn't wear jackets back then. That's me in the white shirt. Uh, formed to, to study HNPCC to try to have more uniform uh, criteria for saying what family actually had this and what families didn't so that we could hopefully offer screening but again keep in mind without a gene you know if you if you if you have hnpcc uh, a mutation or not a mutation let's let's say this is before the mutation or let's say you have this condition and you are pretty sure it's a real thing in your family and you've got four or five kids and the doctor tells you it's autosomal dominant. And you say, well, explain that to me. Well, it means the risk to each of your kids is 50-50. Well, we can offer screening of the type that we do now, but we do that with the knowledge that half of the time we're going to be screening somebody that doesn't even have this condition because we don't have any kind of a genetic marker for it. So we wanted to be at least as sure as we could be that, that, that a given family had this condition, but we also wanted the, the best families so that uh, investigators looking for a gene would have the most fertile soil to be uh, looking in. So I'm going to guess that in this audience, we have a spectrum 
of families that, if we were to look at your pedigree, probably would have been included in those early gene finding studies. But some of you, probably a lot of you are from families where back then, many of us would not have guessed with any certainty at all that you had this condition at all. So it's really only been with the discovery of these genes, we've been able to be certain in a, in a given family, especially one that didn't have a lot of people affected, that, that you actually had this condition at all. Um, so let's oops, thing. okay. So so again, back then all we had were very clinical criteria. We had things that now are just of historical interest. You may have heard people talk about the Amsterdam rule for HNPCC, that to conclude that a family had this condition, they had to have three or more people with colon cancer extending over at least two generations, and one of them had to be young. So think about your own family. Are there at least three people in my family that have had colon cancer? Or later it was changed to, you know, a related cancer like endometrial or ovarian cancer. Are there at least three people in my family? Is it really over two generations? And has there been at least one person uh, under age 50? So this, I, I love audience participation too. I don't have a clicker based thing, but so how many of you are from families where there's at least three people with one of these cancers over at least two generations and somebody under 50 at diagnosis? Okay. How many of you can't say that your family meets these criteria? Yeah, so there's some. Okay, so this actually will become kind of important as, as, as we go through this. Well, so the, the game changer was in 1993. Uh, Albert Della Chapelle uh, at the University of Helsinki in Finland, uh, working with Pivi Peltomaki uh, and looking at families like yours, like some of yours at least, using some of the improved genetic uh, mapping techniques uh, that were rapidly emerging, was able to identify a locus on chromosome 2 uh, that seemed to track with the development of, of cancer. Uh, and it took only six months, less than six months, from the recognition uh, of, of linkage of these various markers to actual sequencing of the gene that would then enable uh, genetic testing. So this did, a couple, this did a couple of important things. One, it confirmed finally once and for all that there is such a thing as HNPCC Lynch syndrome. It's, it's an actual thing because we've actually mapped the, the, the gene for it. But really, in a way... So that's that's really important. But but beyond that, uh, we now have the opportunity to do genetic testing and to say who among this uh, group of otherwise at risk sons, daughters, sisters, brothers, cousins of these people who are at risk, who is actually a carrier of susceptibility so that now those of us that do colonoscopy for a living can at least say, OK, the person that I'm screening definitely has this condition and we can put aside uh, those who do not. At the same time, at the exact same time, uh, Laurie Altonen uh, from the same group, the same issue of science, uh, reported that tumors uh, from uh, families, tumors from patients and families with this condition that they just at the same time uh, were able to confirm was, was a thing, uh, have a, an unusual molecular feature in their tumors we call microsatellite instability. And what that involves, and I have a little picture of that, is uh, when when the genes associated with HNPCC, MSH2, MLH, when they don't work right, uh, they don't uh, detect errors in DNA reproduction properly. And there are certain genes that involve a lot of repeat sequences uh, that are probably regulatory in, in function that have a lot of repeat uh, sequences, you know, CA, 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 CA. Uh, can vary in length. And when there's uh, a tumor present, there's often an increase or a decrease in the length of these sequences uh, that can be uh, detected. And, and what he found was, based on work from other labs, that virtually everybody with uh, a tumor in HNPCC, even if it wasn't colon, uh, actually had evidence of this, this, this unusual, fairly unusual uh, genetic uh, alteration. So this then could become a clue that if a, a, a given cancer patient came across uh, my exam table and I could take a biopsy of that, we could do an assay. It would show if there was microsatellite instability, that, aha, I'll bet this patient has HNPCC. So in the, in the early days, and by that I mean the mid to late 90s, we had to decide if a given colon cancer uh, had HNPCC on the grounds of age of diagnosis uh, and family history uh, before even uh, doing MSI testing because it was very expensive and cumbersome. 
So this is what the typical blot looks like. At the top, we have a single peak. This is the normal uh, number of repeat sequences. But then at the bottom, we, uh, in a tumor, we see that we have you know, the, the, the normal native number of repeat sequences. But because of a mutation, we have uh, a, a different band now that can be uh, detected uh, this way. But that was kind of a laborious, tedious uh, undertaking. Uh, and so we needed more straightforward methods. And so nowadays, nowadays, more, much more likely, much, much, much more likely, a slightly different approach, kind of a surrogate, something gives you the same information, but less tedious, is based on immunohistochemistry. So unless you're a laboratory wonk, this isn't going to mean anything to you. But even, even I, as a humble clinician, can make sense out of this, because we have a GI path conference, and I can say, okay, on the left, we have completely normal colon epithelium. Uh, and that brown staining shows that the mismatch repair gene in this patient is working fine. On the right, we have tumor, uh, and it's pink because we've lost the brown staining. And this tells us that this patient has microsatellite instability because uh, the protein is no longer being expressed. And this has come to become the, become the more standard way uh, of doing this testing, even in institutions that could easily do the, the other method. But even with immunohistochemistry, there are a lot of problems uh, that, that actually led investigators to look at other important things. So uh, if, I, if I biopsied your tumor and you had microsatellite instability, then the next thing we would do would be germline testing. We would draw some blood and sequence your gene. But what was found was more often than not, uh, we would not find a mutation. And the, the older you were, the less of a family history you had, uh, the more likely it was that that genetic testing based on an abnormal tumor finding, uh, the, the, the more likely it would be that that was non-diagnostic. Uh, but unfortunately for a period of time, again, this is only of historical interest now, for a period of time, we would have to continue to treat you uh, as if you had HNPCC because of this microsatellite instability, because we could not prove that you didn't. And the only way that we could prove you 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 didn't would be if we had a genetic test that could reliably exclude it. So we didn't, didn't really have that. So this was kind of problematic. So it, we now know that as much as 80% of all cancer, colon cancer patients with microsatellite in instability, in fact, don't have HNPCC, the challenge is to, te to detect which, uh, which, proportion that, uh, which proportion that is. So although, and this may seem a little bit confusing, uh, although there are a lot of fits and starts with use of tumor testing, uh, and as I'll be talking about here with the advent of panel testing, uh, this is in, in many ways kind of replacing the reliance on tumor testing. We, we nevertheless tend to be doing tumor testing kind of universally in everybody with colon cancer because even those people that don't have HNPCC, that 80% of people that do have microsatellite instability but don't have HNPCC, we now know that those microsatellite tumors, at least in the advanced stage when they need to be treated with chemotherapy, respond altogether differently than microsatellite stable tumors. The usual kind of chemotherapy doesn't work in HNPCC, but some new drugs, pembrolizumab and others, work phenomenally well. But it doesn't, it doesn't really seem to matter whether you have HNPCC or not. So for those reasons, we test everybody's colon tumor for evidence of microsatellite instability. But because of all of the uh, problems with interpretation, uh, we, we have other methods that are evolving uh, that, that can kind of take the place of that. So uh, sorry for when I when I sent this, all my margins were fine, but sometimes, you know, in the software, things get all messed up. So just ignore that. Uh, so what are multi-gene panels? Now, I don't know how many of you were diagnosed uh, on the basis of uh, your doctor just going straight to multi-gene uh, panel testing as opposed to starting with the tumor that had microsatellite instability. I'm going to guess that that most of you, if you're in this room, have had this have been known to have this condition for a while. But I'm guessing most of you started off either with you or your family member who had a colon cancer that was investigated by immunohistochemistry, was found to show microsatellite instability, and then genetic testing was done. Uh, and you may not even remember that, but I'm going to take a chance. So who thinks that's kind of the pattern that led to us, starting with a tumor 
doing some testing and then doing genetic testing. Yeah, quite a few of you, but I'm going to guess you, you maybe don't even remember exactly how that testing was done. So oftentimes the problem is in a given family, in a given family, we're, we're dealing with a, a newer generation of worried well. We, 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 we think that our family has HNPCC, but mom or dad that had colon cancer died and there's no tumor available to do this work on. So as an alternative, we can just go straight to genetic testing, but we have to decide who's going to benefit from that and, and who's not. So most of the work in this area really started off with breast cancer, where there's a big familial hereditary component. A lot of women with breast cancer have BRCA1 or 2 mutations, uh, and they really didn't have the same uh, abnormal tumor findings to drive the evaluation like we have in colon cancer. So because it was common and because we didn't have a tumor-based uh, thing to start with, uh, the development of panel testing uh, really emerged from the breast cancer area. And what it is, is it's a, a host of, uh, of gene sequencing and testing for deletions and other kinds of abnormalities uh, that's done not just on one gene. So see, you've got breast cancer, so we're going to test you for BRCA1. Oh, gosh, that test came back negative. Okay, now let's test you for BRCA2. Oh, that came back negative too. Well, let's test you. So rather than, than kind of nickel and diming it, the laboratories that do these said, well, let's let's just have, now that it's gotten very cheap and easy to do this testing, let's just have every gene that possibly could contribute to breast cancer and, and test for all of them at the same time. Uh, and the yield was actually very high. Uh, and and we talked about this over the last few days uh, at, at our place, and I'm sure at yours also, you know, we all pushed back and said, oh, that's that's such a shotgun. Here's a shotgun. That's such a shotgun approach. That's so inelegant. But the laboratories really pushed this. And frankly, it's come to carry the day. So because of the early successes uh, and, and evidence of utility in breast cancer, uh, it came to be a, a very convenient, easy, inexpensive way to look for colon cancer susceptibility even when there was no tumor available or, you know, we couldn't evaluate it or for whatever reason, uh, it couldn't be done. So in, I think in, in newer situations, somebody diagnosed nowadays, uh, we wouldn't really worry as again, advanced cancer where the treatment, you know, with pembrolizumab or something like that. Yeah. We might evaluate the tumor for those reasons, but if the main concern is, gee, is there's a uh, genetic susceptibility, we would tend more and more to be going straight to this uh, panel testing. Uh, so this is kind of the algorithm, if you will, the the sequence of things that uh, that are the, the way we think about evaluating a tumor. It's kind of maybe hard to follow, but this is actually kind of old data. So basically, it says if you start with a colon cancer, uh, you do tumor testing with micro with either the the so called PCR, uh, you know, look for the new band on the gel or the immunohistochemistry. Uh, if it's normal, probably not HNPCC. If it's abnormal. Uh, there are other tests we can do to kind of sort out, is this likely HNPCC or is it likely a, a, a non-HNPCC sporadic? Uh, and then once we've sorted all that out through this mind-numbing process, uh, we then can go to genetic testing uh, in the hopes of finding a mutation. But now, as I show on the, on the right, there's emerged kind of this alternate pathway where if for whatever reason we can or don't want to do a tumor-based approach, uh, we can just go straight to genetic testing. Uh, models have been developed where a worried well person uh, can walk into their doctor's office and say, gee, I think I have a cancer problem in my family. Uh, and the doctor can go online and pull down a breast model or a colon model. Uh, and based on information like who's had family, who, who in your family's had cancer and how old were they, were they, they can punch it in and come up with a likelihood that you have a gene alteration of some sort. Uh, and depending on that probability, which actually is a fairly low probability, maybe in the range of two and a half percent to 5%, which is pretty low, we will say, okay, you, you would benefit from, uh, from a gene test. Uh, so there are some problems with this approach. I'm not going to go into uh, to all of the details of that. Uh, but the current landscape, I'm here to tell you, is that panel testing for better or worse uh, has become quite routine, um, quite routine, uh, with a very low threshold for uh, undertaking that testing. Uh, a lot of this is changing how we think about genetic counseling. Uh, and because, uh, again, without saying anything against any of our laboratories out there, <clears throat> because of aggressive marketing of these panels by, uh, by these labs to just mainstream doctors, 
the doctors are having to become more and more familiar with the implications of what these tests do uh, and what a finding uh, would actually would actually mean. So uh, if your doctor is more up to speed this year than than he was two or three or he or she was two or three years ago, you know, part of it may be that, you know, the laboratories are kind of pushing uh, a lot of this information on them, which is a good thing. So if you don't have any cancer uh, av available for uh, testing, immunohistochemistry and so forth, or for whatever reason, uh, you or a family like yours uh, wants to undertake genetic testing, this is how this is the huge number of genes that can be included on a panel. And the 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 breast panel and the colon panel are really not that much different because frankly, uh, the colon panels looking for a colon gene include a lot of breast cancer genes. And the breast pa cancer panels include a lot of colon cancer uh, genes. And so the ones in the heavier boxes are the, the the host of genes that are associated with colon cancer susceptibility. And of course, yours, MSH2, MLH1, and so forth, uh, are, are up there. But so are a whole bunch of others. Uh, so again, the importance of genetic counseling, these, these laboratories do tend to encourage People, because there is now direct-to-consumer testing, which I'll talk a little bit more about, because of direct-to-consumer testing, uh, you don't even have to go through a provider. So, you know, if your next-door neighbor uh, is concerned about the risk to cancer in their family, but they don't like to see doctors for whatever reason, they can go online and, again, Google uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing, uh, and they can actually have a kit to that sent to them within a couple of days so that they can be tested for all of the same stuff without ever seeing a doctor, without ever seeing a genetic counselor. And if we're lucky, the information that they get from the website will tell them what they need to know, uh, will we'll recommend or, or help them get to a genetic counselor, hopefully before the testing, more hopefully after the testing, but there's no guarantee. So again, from an advocacy standpoint, those of you in the audience with this condition can, I think, be very, very helpful to uh, kind of a whole new generation of people that are stumbling uh, across information about their uh, genetic susceptibility. And these are just examples uh, of, of the kinds of things that you run across when you, you know, when you do a, a web search for uh, genetic testing. Uh, they're getting very, very uh, inexpensive. A lot of patients express concerns about the cost of genetic testing. And at one time, that was a concern. The testing was $3,000 or more. Now, uh, in many cases, the comprehensive test for everything uh, is actually less than the, the copay for a colonoscopy in some instances. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but just to kind of show what the, the power of these panels is and the things that they can come up with. So this is a not unusual situation. Uh, a young woman comes to see her doctor, maybe a gynecologist, and says, gee, you know, I'm healthy and fine, but I'm worried about the cancer in my family. Notice there's no colon cancer, some fairly early breast cancers. You know, she, what happens if we test this young 24 year old? And this is not an unusual setting. Uh, well, even though she had a breast pan panel done, it includes the colon cancer genes and she's found to have a PMS2 mutation. It's not even any colon cancer in the family, but she's got a colon cancer gene. Uh, so um, yeah, so that's the situation we have. This one hits closer to home, uh, which I'll show you in a second. So sim very similar family, healthy woman, a uh, little bit of a family history of breast cancer, uh, has a genetic testing panel, again, shows a PMS2 mutation, except it's on the other side of the family. And there's not even any immediate cancer on that side of the family. Well, you know, why do I care? Well, she's got a son who's at risk. Well, obviously, that makes sense. You know, she's got a son that, you know, wants to be, will eventually want to be tested to find out uh, if he's a carrier. Well, again, why do I care? Well, it's because it's my grandson. Um, you know, my daughter's gay. Uh, and through an in vitro fertilization process, uh, my daughter-in-law uh, has a son, my grandson, who's got a 50-50 chance of carrying this PMS2 mutation, which by itself is not a big deal. But here's one of the specters that's kind of out there, kind of lurking. We we don't know anything about the sperm donor uh, for my grandson. And it's it's unlikely that he had a you know uh, genetic susceptibility. But we know that PMS2 may actually be the most commonly mutated of the mismatch repair genes. And so on the off chance that the sperm donor has an MSH2, uh, a PMS2 mutation, you know, if my grandson were to inherit the known mutation from my daughter-in-law, uh, and on the off chance that he inherited a mutation from the sperm donor, 
When you have two copies of this, not just one, but if you have two copies, you actually have a devastatingly early severe uh, form of this we call constitutional mismatch repair. That cancer is by the time you're eight or 10 years old. Horrible thing. So, you know, I would kind of want to know. And so we're seeing more and more of these kind of situations. Uh, people are adopted, uncertain parentage, false paternity, in vitro fertilization. So we're seeing a lot more of this. Okay. Well, enough about all of that, because uh, I'm starting to burn through my time. Uh, so what about screening? Well, obviously, this is the, the paradigm, uh, colonoscopy. And, and uh, oftentimes, I'm retired now, but oftentimes, you know, many of the patients on my endoscopy list and Dr. Patel's list are people coming in for uh, colon surveillance. A lot of the guidelines that we now have for surveillance uh, are based on uh, these data from the so-called prospective uh, Lynch syndrome database in Europe. Paul Muller, who's been the driver of this, kind of a character, but dear friend of mine from, uh, from uh, Norway, uh, has this huge registry of data from uh, European centers. So the data here are actually kind of disconcerting. And, and if you don't take really any other message uh, about surveillance uh, from this, uh, then this is important. So these are patients that actually have been under surveillance. These are people who have been getting regular colonoscopy by and large. But you'll notice that despite that surveillance, uh, upwards of 40% of MLH1 patients will eventually have a colon cancer and MSH2 uh, not far behind. So, well, wait a minute, I'm under surveillance to try and identify polyps and remove those polyps before they become cancer. How can this many, how can this many people be developing cancer despite surveillance? Well, you know, we know that, that surveillance is not perfect, that things can be missed. And we, we have very much reason to believe in HMPCC that these tumors tend to evolve very, very quickly and emerge between exams. But this even more distressing uh, data nested within that larger body of data uh, that I just mentioned, uh, data from Germany, where they do colonoscopy every year, uh, Holland, where just by accident, they do, tend to do it more like every two years. And in Finland, where it's more like every three years. So you actually have kind of a historical ability to compare uh, the yield of different screening frequencies. Virtually no difference, no difference in the rates of colon cancer or the stages of, of colon cancer. Very distressing to me. This is not the kind of data that I like to see. Uh, but I have to admit that when we went back and looked at, uh, we have a lot of information from our own institution, most of our uh, data were very, very similar to this. It didn't really seem to make that much uh, difference. Uh, so now the guidelines uh, have, have kind of changed a little bit. Uh, the guidelines actually recognize the differences in risk between MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2 which is a fact that's not known to a lot of your providers, but is a very important one and is being currently reflected uh, in the guidelines. So these are the European guidelines. So in, uh, again, I wanna emphasize these are the European, not American guidelines. In MLH1, MSH2 and MSH6 carriers, the recommended frequency of surveillance is two to three years. And in PMS2, more liberal uh, five-year intervals, uh, the age of initiation, about 20 years old, 25 for MLH1, MSH2, uh, and later from MSH6 and, uh, and PMS2. Uh, these are the NCCN guidelines that I tend to quote because I've been in, on this committee for many, many years. Uh, and there's a lot of text that associate, that's associated with it. You can pull this up pretty easily yourself and, and look at them. So uh, in, the, in the US, at least the NCCN guidelines now provide for a more aggressive uh, surveillance in MSH2 and MLH1, starting at 20, that's supposed to be 20 to 25. Uh, and then at one to two year intervals, uh, we emphasize the importance of colonoscopy quality and Dr. Pell will talk about that. Important to remove adenomas. Uh, and uh, again, this is important to, to, to all of you. Uh, there are screening guidelines for endometrial cancer that'll be talked about by others later. But in the case of MSH6 and PMS2, a somewhat more relaxed approach based on the now recognized lower risk uh, of, of cancer, of colon cancer. So the, the guidelines are recommending starting at 30 to 35 and at one to three year intervals to include an upper GI endoscopy to at least consider an upper endoscopy with colonoscopy. In MSH2 and MLH1, it's actually a recommendation, proactive recommendation to do upper endoscopy. And I know Dr. Uh, Patel has been uh, basically following these guidelines pretty well. Um, uh, 
Uh, so again, because of the increased risk of stomach cancer, we're starting to see we are doing screening in those uh, individuals. My personal view on GYN tumors, again, I'll defer to others talking about it later. We, we have no concrete guidance to act, actually support any particular approach to screening. One of the things we do at MD Anderson, or before I retired, is women uh, at risk of endometrial cancer. When they came in for a colonoscopy, we would arrange to have one of the gynecologists come in and do an endometrial biopsy while they were asleep for the colonoscopy. It takes a little bit of logistic work to get everybody together, but our patients love it. So I'll, I'll kind of start wrapping up with some comments on lifestyle and chemo prevention, again, which others will be talking about a lot. Very important data from uh, John Byrne uh, and a predominantly European uh, collaborative study, the so-called uh, CAP, uh, CAP1 study. Uh, and the conclusion from their baseline study was that uh, aspirin combined with research uh, with resistant starch for as long as four years had no impact on the risk of adenomas of, of precancerous polyps in HNPCC. You see uh, really no difference. This was his conclusion when he announced these data, opened the envelope at an international meeting, because he was hoping to see a real benefit in treating polyps. He said, damn, this isn't what we wanted to see uh, from the study. The good news is they continued following these patients for a long time, even after the study closed. Uh, and they actually found that over a longer period of time of observation, even though there was not a short-term reduction in polyp risk, uh, there was a long-term uh there was a long-term lo uh, lowering of the risk for colon and other HNPCC-related uh, tumors. So what this has driven, uh, and, and again, this is even longer-term data, longer-term data showing that up to 20 years, we still have an improvement in, in cancer risk. Uh, but what this has led to uh, is the so-called CAP3 study, where they're looking at lower doses of aspirin because there are some concerns and again, these are recommendations from various uh, groups around the world in terms of the, the role of aspirin. Again, I think this uh, all this is uh, in, available online. Uh, there are certain uh, caveats or uh, reservations possibly about the use uh, of aspirin. Uh, patients that are older, um, patients that are allergic, uh, patients that uh, really uh, have uh, no, no cardiovascular risk, you know, it may not benefit as much from aspirin, people that have a bleeding tendency. So your your doctor may have second thoughts. And that's part of the reason for uh, the, the CAP3 study looking at lower doses because a lower dose of aspirin uh, may be safer. And again, this is the uh, this is kind of the outline uh, of that. Uh, resistant starch will be talked about more. No real impact of resistant starch alone on colon cancer, uh, but some benefit uh, in treating, uh, some seemingly some benefit uh, in, in other cancers. Uh, so are there other lifestyle things? Well, yes, uh, being overweight in HNPCC seems to be, and this is true uh, in general, but in HNPCC, it's also true that if you're overweight, you're at higher risk of having polyps and cancer. It makes sense. This may be another game changer, uh, back, the possibility of vaccines. Okay, this is really exciting stuff. I'm only very peripherally involved in any of this, but uh, the, the abnormal proteins that are, are a very early event uh, in the development of an HNPCC tumor, the, the abnormal proteins are what we call highly antigenic. That is, the immune system can react to them. Uh, and so we want the immune system to really react to them uh, and, and kill these abnormal proteins in the cells that make them. Uh, and so Matthias Kluhr, uh, a pathologist in Germany, has really pioneered a lot of this work. So let's see if we can raise up uh, a, a vaccine to target uh, the cells that are producing uh, these proteins. And so there are several studies that are being done uh, in the U.S. to evaluate both the safety uh, and as shown on the right, uh, to look at whether these uh, vaccines can possibly reduce the risk of polyps uh, and cancer. Uh, and this is another uh, uh, similar study being done by uh, Eduardo Valar Sanchez. So patient advocacy, there's going to be a whole uh, conversation about this. So I'm not going to really say much about that because I'm starting to run out of time. Um, I think we're going to be seeing uh, almost universal testing uh, for MSI, again, not only because of concerns about HNPCC being present, but again, differences in therapy in people that have advanced cancer. Uh, I think we're getting to where uh, routine uh, testing of all cancers uh, is, is the case. 
Uh, we're getting less rigorous. And I think may, in some ways that's good, some ways that's bad, less rigorous about how we think about uh, genetic counseling. We want the information, but there are other more media-based models. Look at this video to give you all the information you need rather than a face-to-face -face with a counselor. Um, I think increasingly with our electronic medical records, there will be ways that we can get your family history uh, into our electronic medical record uh, and, and see to it that that information is well curated and tended and that some of the inaccuracies that are present uh, are gotten rid of. Uh, the things that I think are, are coming uh, are universal testing for cancer. And I talked about this a bit in a lecture the other night. It's getting so cheap. There are so many settings where we can't anticipate the, the possible benefit of this. I think a day may come where even though it's already kind of available on the basis of direct consumer testing, if you're worried well and want this, you can get it. But I think a day may not be that far off where we just consider it routine to test everybody for cancer susceptibility, cardiovascular disease susceptibility, just like we test newborns for certain uh, inborn uh, errors of, of metabolism. The thing is, there are certainly downsides to that, but one of the things that a group like you know uh, is that being afraid of a genetic diagnosis doesn't really help anybody. We have to embrace that. Uh, and what better way to embrace that than by mainstreaming the entire process and basically saying, hey, you know, let's get over our hangups. We'll let the genetic counselors deal with the fallout of the tons of information that's going to come when we test everybody. But you know, if we can get over our hangups, I think it may turn out that the benefits uh, outweigh uh, the risk. Uh, so, and, and I know I'm about out of time, but uh, one of the things that's kind of exciting and it's over my head and I'm retired and uh, I won't be in the game much, uh, but there may be ways of detecting some of these, like really, I mentioned the, the frame shift peptides, some of these, these funny proteins and uh, proteins associated with tumors. So it may be possible with simple blood tests to detect these possibly as a screening test for very early cancer and maybe even the polyps uh, that precede them. And so there are studies already doing that in high-risk people looking to see if some of these blood markers uh, can, can be helpful. And so these are the things that I think are going on, but I think the things that I'm most excited about are the things that we can only imagine. Uh, and I think one of the things that ben would benefit all of us is a very fertile imagination. Uh, and on that note, I can say one of the things I loved about Dennis uh, Anand was his very fertile imagination. And Swati had kind of alluded to this in a conversation the other day is that probing question, I can't remember exactly how she put it, but but if, if here's where we are and here's where we want to be, what's it going to take to get us there? And if we, if we aren't thinking about that question of what's it going to take to get us there, we're never really going to be able to design studies to to get to that. And so uh, fortunately, in, in Dr. Patel and her colleagues, we have people that that are you know ready to stretch their imagination, say, OK, here's where we are. Here's what what, what can we do to get there? So uh, I think it's an exciting time to be involved in this field. I'm very excited, uh, looking forward to the other speakers and the chance to uh, visit with you all uh, informally. Uh, one of the things I loved about my dad was uh, he had a lot of energy when he would get up and talk, but he was he he loved to mingle with folks and big hulk of a guy, six foot six, you know, and he'd kind of kind of you know hover over people, but it was because he had such a passion for all this stuff and and loved to talk to patients. And so uh, I'm going to take my jacket off and maybe even loosen my tie so I can be as approachable as possible during the day. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Lynch, I know you probably want to take a sip of water, but we'd love to open the floor to questions uh, for Dr. Lynch. We have some time. Um, please feel free to approach the two microphones or we can uh, come to you if you raise your hand. Um, I'll start off with a question, Dr. Lynch. Uh, just come up to me later. Yes, yeah. of course. Um, certainly throughout the day, we can continue these conversations, but some of the, the last few slides um, really generate excitement and anticipation. Um, from a historical perspective, can you kind of, if you were to forecast, because you were in this field from its inception, really, um, if you could forecast some of the biggest ways that you see the lives of patients changing from the prevention side of things, what do you think is going to be 
the biggest difference in what our patients are, are currently doing. Well, hopefully I touch on a few. I think one of the most important things from the standpoint of prevention is, again, I hopefully don't have to tell this, but, but I'm going to guess that even in your own families, there are brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, cousins that don't want to get tested, don't want to hear about this, uh, are afraid to come see Dr. Patel for a colonoscopy. You know, I, th I think the most important thing that I see is that as all of this stuff becomes more mainstream, as your doctors get more comfortable with these diagnoses, uh, as you get more comfortable with having a condition like this in your family, and we become more matter of fact about this, you know, these are chronic diseases, you know, it's, uh, it's not like diabetes where you know, take your insulin and, you know, but but these are chronic, these are things that are a lifelong uh, issue for you and members of your family. We have to get over uh, our unwillingness to basically say, yeah, it's it's an issue just like diabetes. It's just something we have to deal with. So I think that is something that that is going to be happening increasingly no matter what, no matter what kind of imagination uh, anybody has, because this is just it's it's like a wave that's just kind of coming over us. And it's kind of a nice warm wave that, that I, I personally welcome. Uh, the thing that I think will be uh, hopefully a game changer will be some of these vaccines, you know. If they're successful, uh, they could they potentially can be used uh, in conjunction with some of these other really exciting new chemotherapy medications. For I mean, I've had patients with HNPCC colon cancers uh, treated with drugs like pembrolizumab that didn't even get operated on for their colon cancer because the tumor melted away with chemotherapy. Still, colon looks a little bit funny, but you biopsy the bejesus out of it, and then there's no cancer there. So I think that's going to be kind of a game changer. And the, the vaccines, if successful, uh, may uh, be an important supplement to those kinds of chemotherapies, but may be even more important in, in preventing uh, those colon cancers in the first place by identifying the very earliest cells that are going to become the adenoma, that are going to become the cancer, and actually kill off those cells before they uh, before they emerge. Uh, and I think maybe what what Swati was getting at is, is some of these lifestyle things. You know, I, I will admit I was kind of a naysayer. You know, I felt that, you know, if you had one of these gene mutations, your risk of cancer was such that it really didn't matter what you ate or how well you took care of yourself or any of that. But I think the data that we've seen from, you know, the aspirin studies and some of the other uh, interventions have shown that that. And this is a, a note of hopefulness, certainly. But even if you have a susceptibility, even if it's one of the worst ones, wor you know, badder ones like MSH2 or MLH1, even if you have a susceptibility, we can really impact that risk by use of agents like aspirin. We just don't know the right dose yet. And there may be able to combine it with other medications that help too. So, you know, there are things in addition to your surveillance uh, that I think will help. And then lastly, you know, the eye, you know, it, it really bothers me that that colonoscopy has not been more thoroughly effective uh, in identifying the adenomas uh, that, that lead to cancer. And so I think some of the newer techniques that are emerging, the possibility as we are thinking about longer intervals between exams, um, again, European data seem to suggest that doing it every year doesn't really make that much difference. So maybe we ought to just do it every two or three years but we're nervous about the idea of thinking about those longer intervals. But there are some uh, non-invasive tests. We've been talking a bit about the last few days, uh, testing for uh, blood uh, and mutated DNA in the stool that uh, if we missed something on the colonoscopy yesterday, and we're planning to bring you back in two or three years, but we do this stool test next year and it's abnormal, it's like, well, maybe we missed something. Maybe we ought to bring them back sooner and then pick it up, pick it up then. So I think, I think having adjuncts, having alternative supplemental approaches in the screening arena uh, are important. And, I, and honestly, you know, I, I spent all day, every day doing colonoscopy, but I welcome uh, the introduction uh, of, of uh, you know, additional complementary uh, approaches to uh, surveillance, whether it's looking for circulating tumor cells or fragments in the blood or in the stool, but uh, clearly colonoscopy by itself. I cannot guarantee you that if if I or Dr. Patel does a colonoscopy on you every year, I cannot guarantee you that you won't develop a cancer despite that. Uh, and we need to do better than that. 
Other questions? Yes, uh, looks like we've got a bunch of hands up. For others who want to approach the podium, uh, you may as well. So I like history, and you were there at the conception. Um, I don't know if you went back to why you don't call it Lynch syndrome, and I wondered if you had any uh, uh, quick stories about uh, the uh, Amsterdam uh, crites area. I'm a three, two, one person that was diagnosed with colon cancer at age 16, so I fall under the Amsterdam criteria. I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, for me, the Amsterdam criteria are of historic interest. So, you know, if you're, and, and this is unlikely, but if you go to your doctor and your doctor went to medical school in the 1990s, and they got a lecture on HNPCC at that time. Gene was known, but you know what? What, what they remember was the uh, was, was the Amsterdam criteria. I was actually there at the Prinzen Grax Hotel. Uh, I was the one that took that picture of the old slide carousel. Remember slide carousel, um, and uh, where those those criteria came. But um, um, yeah, so so some of your kind of old timer doctors may still have in mind the Amsterdam criteria. But a host of studies, a host of studies uh, have confirmed that many, many, many families don't meet those criteria. So if your doctor says, well, gee, you know, there aren't three cases and nobody's especially young, you know, that doesn't really carry any water anymore. I think where the three to one rule, it, you know, if it has any importance at all, you know, if your family does meet those criteria, you know, three colon cancers, you know, over multiple generations, somebody very young, probably a little bit more likely that you have an MSH2 or an MLH1 mutation. If your family doesn't meet those criteria, more likely that it's an MSH6 or a PMS2. Uh, but, you know, we see families that have MSH2 and MLH1 mutations, more bad ones, where yeah, the cancer ages don't seem all that young. Uh, they're kind of the exception, but uh, so it, it's kind of all over the place. And so that's why I'm saying is, yeah, the three, two, one, you know, the, the Amsterdam thing is it's it's kind of a handy frame of reference, but uh, I don't use it anymore at all. I'm guessing Dr. Patel doesn't either. It, it just, it was important at the time. There was the, these other, these so-called Bethesda guidelines for when you should do tumor testing. Um, when tumor testing was, was hard to do, not many labs did it. It was expensive. Uh, you know, how strong did your family history, history have to be? How young did you have to be before we would say it was worth doing the tumor testing? Well, because of the circumstances at the time, that was the best we could do. Those guidelines were helpful. Now, largely of historic interest only. So don't get, yeah, history is great. I love, I'm, I'm kind of a history buff at, at heart, but don't get too hung up on things that were valid then, uh, but, but really aren't important now. Ken. I'm just an old geologist, but I'm thinking about the world of data that we've seen. So I'm very hard to so I'm... I, Pardon me? I said, I'm just an old geologist thinking about the world of data that we've seen emerge. Mm -hmm. Three things are coming to my mind. You touched on them here. The testing that is now becoming available, you said, and it's relatively cheap. But somebody has to pay for it. Mm -hmm. This might be a cohort of people who have encountered insurance companies who say, well, we don't think so yet. Well, what does that do to our world of data? Maybe we have to wait another 50 years to get the kind of data sets that are scientifically aha. I'm thinking about your slide where the guy said, damn, <laughs> that happens too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love this slide. And I'm thinking about the world of all the data that's going to be coming available to mm -hmm. us, especially if we can get somebody to say it's important to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And we have this wealth of data coming to us as we're approaching the finite limits of digital computers to analyze that data in a timely manner. I'm wondering if you have encountered thoughts yet about the world of this science and the emergence of quantum computers right. and AI. Well, you know, and we, we get answers to the science questions right. that we want. Well, to ask. so actually, we had a conversation about AI. We, we're actually using AI to help us find polyps better in the colon. Uh, which, so, but that's really not the context. So, you know, insurance issues. I glossed over them, and hopefully they'll crop up again. 
you know, our, and I'm going to guess this is true here too. Our genetic counselors spend way more time than, than I think makes any sense uh, trying to determine if an insurance company is going to pay for uh, tumor testing or genetic testing in a particular context. Okay. Is that safe to say? We spend more time on that than we'd like to. But so that's the bad news. The good news is I think that's rapidly changing the barriers. Uh, the barriers are falling uh, as it gets cheaper. Well, if it's cheap enough, uh, an insurance company will be willing to do it versus if it's expensive. Uh, the 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 amount of data that's coming in support of this is like water out of a, of a, of a fireman's hose. Uh, so I think the correct me if I'm wrong, genetic counselors, but I think many of the insurance barriers that had been there in the past are rapidly falling and becoming less and less of an issue. Some of it aided by legislation, but some of it just by driven by the data. But again, the cost has gotten so cheap uh, that, you know, in the range of like $200, or is that about right? About $200 for, for a panel test. So, you know, if the family gets together, I mean, if, if you have a really poor family, and I think some of the, some of the uh, testing labs, you know, have kind of a, compassionate situation where even truly indigent people can get testing. But even if you don't have $200, this is a family issue. So, you know, can, can we get all the siblings together to pool, you know, 50 bucks each so that the person most likely to have a positive test can be tested? Sure. So uh, I, I think that the, the cost need no longer be a barrier. So when I had to tell a patient, you know, the insurance may not cover it, it's going to be $3,000 out of pocket. Whoa. You know, but now I say, yeah, chances are the insurance company will pay for it. But even if they don't, two hundred dollars. That's that's like I said, often less than the copay for a procedure. So multiple questions. We'll take one more question, and then please, we encourage you to hound Dr. Yeah, Lynch yeah. all anybody, day. Yeah, that's why he's here. here. So I, I'll be here all day. <laughs> Come and grab me anytime. Um, uh, chase me down in the in the in the bathroom. You know, I have an old prostate, so I'm in the bathroom a lot. But let's take this one last question from my dear friends here. Really quick, um, regarding the insurance thing, I don't care how much the testing costs. What I'm concerned about is the long term effects of that test. Meaning, I'm thinking of a dystopian future where I am, my son is, my grandson is labeled as having this, and all of a sudden we're labeled as invalid or not able to get insurance and the, the long-term cost right. significantly outweighs the upfront cost of the right. test. So I don't know if this is going to be covered elsewhere during the day. And, 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 and if not, it probably, probably should have been, this would be something for next time. Um, I, I think th this is a real concern. Uh, this has led in some situations to people uh, and we still see this. Some people saying, you know, I want genetic testing, but I'm so afraid of discrimination in the workplace or insurance. I want to do this testing under an assumed name. You know, I'm I'm going to be John Doe. And I don't know how many, uh, you know, the labs that do this stuff, I, 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 I assume that they're willing to do this testing under an alias. They're not happy about it. But there are certain situations where, you know, some where patients will, they're so terrified of the implications of it that they'll actually be tested under an assumed name. So that's how anxious people can be. The good news is most of these concerns about discrimination are more imaginary than, than real. Yes, it can happen. But again, I think the key is as all of this gets more mainstream, as all of your doctors uh, and all of the people in your family and all of your neighbors and all of the people on TV and all of the people doing the podcasts, as all of them get more matter of fact about this whole thing. It was just... Is just another brick in the wall, just another thing to deal with, uh, especially now that we have interventions that can really make a difference. You know, this is, you know, just because you have an alteration of one of these genes doesn't mean you're going to die or die young. We have things too. So it just, it's just something to manage, you know, uh, and I, I, so I'm very optimistic that, uh, and, and it's, but it's definitely something within a family you really have to process this within your family because uh, this is something that's very near and dear to me. It's very important to me because I know every family has got its weirdos in it that uh, <laughs> my family in particular, but, but, but every family has got a whole range uh, of, of concerns and worries. Uh, so there's not a family out there that doesn't have somebody 
who's afraid to be tested because they, they just don't want to know and, and so forth. So, you know, it, it's, it's a process. It's an ongoing thing. Uh, but I, but, it, but I think everything is moving in the right direction toward these concerns, which are entirely valid, becoming less and less of a concern uh, as, as time. And so the more matter of fact, we all can be about it, then I think the fewer uh, of those concerns on the part of the kind of, you know, doctor averse uh, members of our family uh, will be. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. And Mr. Patzer, thank you for that question. I'm really excited that you brought that up because it is an incredibly important issue. And we have an entire session this afternoon dedicated to talking through some of these things where we want to hear your voice and your perspective on these barriers to communicating results to family and thinking about the next generations, because it's a rapidly changing time. And in, you know, us millennials, what we grew up with is so different than, than what we can imagine our kids uh, growing into. So I'm glad you brought that up. So that uh, concludes our session this morning uh, with our keynote speaker, Dr. Patrick Lynch. Uh, we really greatly appreciate you coming and giving us a grand overview um, and topics that despite your request, we will continue to refer to your presentation about throughout the day.